the Johnson Space Center. And I don't know whether I'm a lucky charm or an unlucky charm, but they don't <laughs> last long in that job after I talk to them. Hopefully they go on to bigger and better things. You know, they either go off and form your own major company or you become the director itself. Um, so I'll, I'll call myself a lucky charm, but they don't seem to last long in that job if, if when Rice goes to talk to them. But, but Steve, is a, he's currently serves as the president and CEO of Intuitive Machines, which is the company that he founded seven years ago now. It has, goes fast by really quickly. And what Intuitive Machines do, we'll hear a lot about tonight, but it develops and deploys advanced space systems and space infrastructure, particularly with a focus on the moon. And again, we'll hear a lot about that tonight. Supporting NASA's goals of a sustainable presence at the moon. Um, as I mentioned, he was the deputy director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. Um, and in that, in that role and roles prior to that, he led and directed human spaceflight architecting efforts, identifying affordable concepts and you can define affordable differently if you're commercial or if you're NASA. Um, affordable context for taking humans to the edge of deep space while growing the US technological economy and continuing international competitiveness. And that's something that he has continued in the time that he, since he's left NASA too. So again, we're very honored to have him. And I think we'll probably keep the lights on so that people can see you on the camera unless you want them dimmed. But, no, that's great. I don't want to. Then Steve, thank you very much. It's all yours. Please join me in welcoming you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, it's a really nice, relaxing venue. You know, you can have a beer outside before you get started. This is really nice. Um, so the premise of uh, the discussion I wanted to have tonight was a challenge that we're faced with in Intuitive Machines as a company, and that is uh, challenged to return the United States to the moon for the first time in 50 years for less than $100 million and do it in 30 months. And so it is an, a, an intractable problem. It's an extraordinarily difficult problem. And I wanted to talk to you about how we're doing that and how we're being successful at that um, and how we're setting up a new paradigm for exploration of the moon and the solar system by the way we're working in this new commercial space um, time in history. Uh, and I'll, I'll share with you some of the things that we're that are our internal secrets about how we do things, um, how we're able to make this work. Um, how many people have noticed the phase of the moon tonight? What is it? Half moon, right? Half moon, right? It's beautiful, right? So um, <clears throat> this slide right here that you see, um, you know, every one of the secrets we have in this idea of getting to the moon very rapidly and low cost and everything is, is about the workforce. It's about the talent. It's about how we feel inside and uniting our passion for space with a mission to the moon that's right in front of you. And every night, everyone in the company goes home and looks at the moon and they look at the moon differently. They look at the moon that it's attainable, like you can reach out and touch it. That spirit that is in our company is something that's palpable. You can feel it when you walk around. The energy, the enthusiasm, the, the urgency, it, that's one of the things. You get your workforce motivated, and off you go. You can almost do anything. It's limitless. So this is kind of me staring at the moon, I guess, or uh, effigy of me. And I do look at the moon differently. I'll tell you one quick story I was with. Uh, chartered to do a human spaceflight architecture uh, called uh, the Gateway. Mark Jernigan, you remember that, right? And it's a current program, a record. But we went around, we architected it at NASA, and we went around the world to, trying to sell it to all of the international partners for the International Space Station and say, get your organizations lined up to put a long-distance spacecraft or space station 60,000 kilometers behind the moon at Lagrange point two, Earth, Moon, Lagrange, L2. And so we did this and we started in Paris and we had the Japanese and we had the Russians and we had the ESA, the Europeans and the Germans and the Japanese. <clears throat> and we presented this concept of staying outside the gravity well and being behind the moon. And it was snowing, beautiful in Paris. We had worked all day you know, stopped and had some wine and cheese at the end of the day and then took a stroll through Paris and we walked by Notre Dame. And there, 
the 10 of us who were presenting this are staring at Notre Dame, and there's a full moon, and it's snowing outside. And I turned to him and I said, we're the only people on Earth thinking about going 60,000 kilometers beyond the moon at this moment in history. That one is, is quite compelling, and that's how we, uh, that passion comes out when we're thinking and talking about the moon, and I've never looked at the moon the same ever since that whole effort, and it's now leaving NASA, I formed a company that now we're able to go to the moon, um, and it's right there in front of us, and I'll talk about it. So, next one, I wanted to show you a video, a short video, well, maybe it's three minutes long, but it seems, it seems a little bit longer when you, you let it unfold, to give you the ethos of intuitive machines. You know, how it feels inside the, inside the company, uh, what it looks like, how people are working. And this was the time when uh, Spaceport Houston agreed, the city council approved, to fund a $40 million building for intuitive machines to expand. That was you, Dave. So, <laughs> to um, have intuitive machines expand into a brand new 125,000 square foot facility on Spaceport Houston. And it gives you the, or I speak at uh, thanking the city council and everything, and a number of people got up and spoke. And uh, it just gives you a sense of how our company formed. So take a look and a listen. On behalf of Intuitive Machines, what a proud day for us today. Thank you for being here for the announcement of yet another big day for Space City. They're going to the moon with a purpose. Congratulations, Steve, to you and your team at Intuitive Machines. Back in 2012, I had the idea for a think tank company. I remember I was in um, Washington, D.C. with Dr. Cam Gaffarian. We were at a local restaurant when he pointedly asked me, Steve, what are you passionate about? So I started scribbling on a napkin and I said, you know, I have this idea to take what we've learned in NASA human spaceflight uh, methodologies and, of engineering and apply it to solving some of the more intractable problems around the world. And he paused for a moment and he said, Steve, it would be a shame for the music in your head never to be played. Let's do it. And that's how the company was formed, that's how the partnership was formed, and that's why we're here today. The Commercial Lunar Payload Service Program has been a catalyst for us, has given us the opportunity to be the first commercial company to land on the moon. When that spacecraft touches down on the moon, our city will cheer and celebrate like no other city in the United States. We take that responsibility absolutely seriously at Intuitive Machines. Watching success after success, we have learned never to be surprised about the next major announcement coming out of Intuitive Machines. Right now, we're eight months or so away from launching our first mission to the moon, and 18 months from our second mission, which will make Intuitive Machines the first to ever land on the south pole of the moon, drill for water ice on the moon, hop or explore uncharted areas of the moon in permanently shadowed craters, and actually use cellular technology for the first time on the moon. The demand for achieving all of these feats, remarkable feats, has stretched the limits of our facility here. And it's not just the fact that they're gonna have 125,000 square feet, it's what they're gonna be doing within that 125,000 square feet. I'd say from a napkin in 2012, to moving to the spaceport in 2018, and our new home starting today, we grew up as a company with Spaceport Houston. We continue to grow as Spaceport Houston grows. We choose to be here, partnering with the city, Houston Airport System, San Jacinto College, because this is our home, a place we're surrounded by family and friends, and people of true grit, whether it's a flood, a pandemic, or a challenge of going to the moon, Space City doesn't back down from a challenge. So this building represents intuitive machines accepting humanity's greatest challenges. Thank you very much. So it was very nice. The uh, city council came out. They voted in favor of the building. We've ratified the lease, and we're breaking ground here uh, 
uh, first of December or first week of December on the new facility out there. So, oops, there we go. So it's it's quite exciting. And as you heard, I said in the video, it gives you a sense inside the production facility what it looks like and the people working and everything. But um, yeah. The NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Service contract is a 10-year contract that NASA put out to see if anybody in the United States could land on the moon, uh, fix price, uh, and deliver science payloads to the moon, and return that science payload data back to Earth, right? And then the rest of it was your responsibility as a company. So you had to build everything it took to get to the moon, get the data back, and give the data to NASA. That's the challenge. And we won that contract. That's a 10-year contract to bid on missions to the moon. And that 10-year contract was nine vendors won that. And what you could do is now every time they wanted to do fly some payloads to the moon, they would put out a task order and you would bid on it. And we spent our first $5 million dedicated to moon starting in 2018 on building a mobile test stand to fire our engine, 3D printers to print our engine, and to get a blue flame and put that in our proposal to show that our engine could perform. Um, and we won that first task order. Uh, we won it with two other bidders. One fell out already, and the other one is Astrobotic out of Pittsburgh. And it turned out we are now the first company to return the United States to the moon. And we're slated to go in March of 2022. It's right around the corner. Um, it's incredible. Uh, you know, now whether we go in 30 months or whether we go in 36 months in the scheme of history, that's, inc that's phenomenal. It's incredible. And how we did that, so um, I'll talk to you a little bit about, but we're now the first company, commercial company, to land on the moon. The first to return the United States to the moon in 50 years. Our second mission we want was to land a drill and drill a meter deep into the surface and detect water ice with a mass spectrometer in the tailings pile. So we're first to land on the South Pole um, ahead of nation states. China is going to land on the South Pole in 2024. We're landing on the South Pole in December of 2022. That's our second mission that we want. We're going to hop off of the lander with our hopper technology. That was another technology that we won from uh, NASA that was our invention into a permanently shadow crater that has never seen light or any human eyes. And we're going to take pictures and temperature inside that crater and see if there's water ice in the bottom of that crater on the South Pole. We also teamed with Bell Labs and Nokia Bell Labs uh, to fly 4G LTE to the moon and test that communication link on the moon. Um, so just a number of firsts uh, for a small company. and. It's just an incredible time in history where we find ourselves uh, where a company of roughly 150 people can, to, can endeavor to achieve landing on the moon. It's just a great place to, to live in the United States. That we have that kind of um, uh, look at it. Let me, this idea, this time in history is what I want to kind of talk about. So prior to... I guess in 2012, 2008, 2012, in those administration, presidential administrations there, the moon was essentially a four-letter word. We were not supposed to go back to the moon. We were supposed to build technologies that uh, develop capabilities go to Mars. So we couldn't really kind of work on that, and that's how that whole gateway uh, program came about, which was to stay outside the gravity well of the moon. Well. The National Space Council since then, after, uh, I guess in uh, probably 2017, 2016, 2017, said, the moon is of strategic importance to the United States. We must return humans to the moon in a sustainable way. It is the high ground that the United States needs to take. No other country should have that because the United States should own the values, the behaviors, the practices of how to deal peacefully in outer space, and you do that by demonstrating technical prowess to own the high ground, to land on the moon, orbit the moon, um, live and work on the moon, right? So that was a National uh, Space Council imperative. So then, 
Couple that in history with the Office of Space Commerce, who says there's a new way to purchase goods and services from, that, from, the, from the government. Let's maximize the use of commercial services. Let's use the most of commercial technology. Put that together with non-traditional procurement methods uh, and public-private partnerships, and now you have a recipe to create something like the CLIPS program, which was you go do it industry, you go figure out how to do it, and we'll fund you, and we'll take the risk as a government. And that's the paradigm shift that's occurred that allows us to compete to go to the moon. So you have new procurement strategies. You have an imperative from national security and national space to get back to the moon. And you have these technologies like low-cost access to the moon through SpaceX. They've, they've dropped the cost of uh, access to space by an order of magnitude over the past 10 years. And that has enabled us as a small company to say, okay, if I can get a rocket for roughly $60 million that'll take me out in the vicinity of the moon, I can build a lander for it. I can build a communication network to communicate with it. It's suddenly achievable. It's no longer in the billions, right? Um, so that has, is the time in history that we are right now. Um, and it's the reason the moon will always be sustainable from here on out. It's not about technology. We've been there. We've done that. We need to go to Mars. It is an imperative to, like low Earth orbit, you go and you work and you live and you communicate in and around the Earth, low Earth orbit. It is the next frontier. And you need to go there and stay and continue to live and work and communicate and navigate and, and use the moon as a jumping off point. Now, <clears throat> NASA happened to be you know, you don't want to militarize space. So NASA became the point of the spear for humans uh, to return to the moon, uh, not the Defense Department. So if, if the government could show through soft power that the United States, the US economy, can put many shots of on goal or many landers up at the moon, that's an incredible demonstration of US technical prowess coming out of our U.S. economy. So that shows strength. And that's why nine bidders were selected for this contract to go do it. Now it's up to 14 bidders that can bid on every single mission. And we have um, six, seven missions now going to the moon, seven landers being built, um, plus a human lander, eight landers being built in the United States, where in 2018 there was zero. So this whole imperative has created a whole nother economy about the moon that we can have access to, okay? Let me go to the next one here. Now, how do we do it? So what we did was we invested in technologies that were the most difficult things that needed to be done in order to get to the moon. So by vertically integrating those, we now are not reliant on third party vendors or other vendors who might have supply chain issues, they're in-house. So our propulsion system, if you're gonna fly a spacecraft, you gotta own your propulsion system because propulsion's hard. Um, and it, you can't be dependent on a, on a technology company that's trying to build a propulsion system and it's holding your, your schedule hostage. So agility demands that we own the technology. And so we own a liquid oxygen, liquid methane, cryogenic, propulsion system that we developed in-house, and we 3D print those engines. The igniter, the injector, the combustion chamber, all of that we 3D print. And we test it, and we test it right at the spaceport. I actually have a video uh, to show you that that, uh, that engine being tested out at uh, Spaceport Houston on Ellington Field. Actually, Byron was there for one of the tests, right? So, um, very loud. Very cool, very loud, yeah. So uh, optical navigation. There is no GPS around the moon. So we invested in precision landing and hazard avoidance technology that would allow us to land with about 50 meters accuracy on the moon. So that's pretty incredible. And so we've been developing optical navigation techniques, synthetic imagery, um, natural features recognition, 
Compare a little bit with the maps coming out of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and the rest is like uh, delta position as you see the craters move and you measure your velocity with accuracy, you can tell where you are. And then you can actually see, our system can see um, 10 degree slopes and above, and 10 centimeter boulders, size of a bowling ball, and above. So we know we can land um, on a slope of less than 10 degrees and less than 10 centimeter boulders, and our lander was designed that way. So that, we're the only company that actually has that uh, precision landing and hazard avoidance technology. Uh, the other interesting thing, well, I'll get on the next chart about our lunar communications network, but I'll talk about it. Our ability to rendezvous, capture, and uh, do proximity operations and capture in and around the moon from orbit uh, to orbiting um, uh, uh, bodies and landers. I'd like to put those together in space. We have that technology. We have Earth entry vehicle technology. So these are the things you can't buy in the market, and you have to develop the skills and create those skills. So I talked about passion and mission and, and putting those together. Now you put those together with technology to create that agility, right? And uh, we're seeing that we're, you know, three to five times faster than government programs, than other big aerospace programs. Um, the lunar communications, for example, the deep space network was actually been under study for 10 years on how to upgrade that for a lunar distance network to communicate with the Earth dishes to the moon, right? Um, it's still not in place. There's still not an upgrade to the deep space network. And in two years, uh, we've built and went around the world, and we have six antennas around the world now, anywhere from 18 meters to 64 meters, big radio astronomy dishes. We contracted with each of them, three in the northern hemisphere, three in the southern hemisphere, to actually communicate at lunar distance. So we essentially built our own mini Apollo program. We build our own lander, we put it on our own, the rocket that we buy, and we communicate back as we fly that mission back to our own commercial lunar network. Um, and so it's just chipping away at the problem and, and saying, you know, that you gotta solve this if you're gonna get to the moon in the next 30 months. I'll talk more about that um, on the next slide. But if you take that team I'm talking about, um, and they have world-class domain expertise with their, with their passion for the moon, you put those together with our technologies, our advanced manufacturing techniques, and then this idea of arbitrary and inflexible milestones. You must be here, avionics, software, GNC, propulsion, you must be here at this date to go out on the runway and test your systems together in an integrated test bed. And you got to do it again and again and again, and it's arbitrary set by me or the program manager. Let's go out and test. And by testing often, rapidly iterating, and continuing to learn from our failures, much like SpaceX is doing down in Boca Chica uh, with the Starship, we're able to make incredible progress. The other piece that's, that's uh, off to the side is the supporting organizations like um, procurement, uh, HR, human resources, accounting, accounts payable, accounts receivable, all of the back office support in a company has to be part of the solution to move you forward. You cannot have an office full of lawyers with terms and conditions on every contract that you try to put out there saying, slow down, no, no, too much liability, you can't do that. You have to equip those supporting organizations with an offense to go be part of the solution so that you can get the job done, you can get the paperwork out, and you can move it forward. That's, that's a, a secret I got from a book called Exponential Organizations. And you look at your organization, and you find out how many people in the organization can say no versus yes if, right? And so if you make your organization come up with a solution versus saying no, you're not allowed to do that, that changes the whole dyna dynamic inside the organization. So every single person in the organization is empowered to find a solution to get the job done, to fly the mission within 30 months. So that's what gets us our unmatched speed of execution. I swear we're going to write a book about it <laughs> before this is all done and kind of uh, teach how to move fast uh, with excellence. 
Um, here I talk about um, the world's only commercial near space communication network. So an interesting story here is uh, these are where our antenna dishes are around the world, uh, back to our mission control center in Houston. That's in the Boeing building on the sixth floor. It's in two of the machines offices. We built a control center called Nova Control. Um, when NASA gave us the contract, I thought they said, you're not allowed to use the Deep Space Network, the DSN. It's how they track all the NASA spacecraft going out in the deep space, Voyager, the Mars missions, etc. So we said, okay, how are we going to communicate? We had to figure it out. So we went around the world to different countries and contracted with them to actually get on contract for a number of years and put our technology at the base of their antenna. Now these dishes are underutilized. They're staring out in the space, radio astronomy, listening for signals from deep space. We said, hey, can you cover our lunar mission? And they jumped at the opportunity. So we put our copy of our Nova Control software at the base of the antenna. We route that back to Houston to our, no our mission control. And we now put it on our displays and our operators see it. So now it's become a, quite the asset where we have the only lunar distance network. The Air Force doesn't have one. NASA doesn't have one. Goddard's trying to put one together. It's called uh, LunaNet. Um, none of the other vendors have put one together. And so it's been quite an advantage for us. And that was an example of you got to solve the problem. You can't just say, I, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. You got to figure out a way. And that's what this network did. Um, here's where we are today. Um, our goal was in 2018, no one was going to the moon. And suddenly we needed to create a commercial market or see a commercial market to actually go to the moon. To have commercial entities want to build payloads and fly to the moon. David Alexander and I were talking over a beer outside about what kind of payloads can Intuitive Machines and Rice University do and deploy to the moon, right? Um, now we're thinking about it because it's achievable. So what we did was at risk, we took, this is not done without risk. We said we want our first mission Let's aim for an annual cadence of missions. So mission one, mission two, and mission three. So now Intuitive Machines has three bites at the apple. You know, we may lose a mission. 40%, only 40% of all missions aimed to go to the moon have ever succeeded, including all the Apollo missions. There's a 60% failure rate in going to the moon. So we knew our company would not be robust against a failure unless we put in many missions. And now we have three missions going to the moon over the next uh, three years or so. So I have a mission in March of 22, of December of 22, and the, th and the first quarter of 24. And here is our Nova Sea lander. It's a 2,000 kilogram lander. It stands 12 feet high. You see uh, it has two big gold wrapped helium tanks. Top deck has a solar array on it. You can see the, the nozzle for the engine down below. That's a liquid oxygen, liquid methane. Uh, first ever cryogenic liquid oxygen, liquid methane flown in space um, on this mission. And our payloads are put on the uh, outside. Um, we generate about 600 watts of power. It weighs 2,000 kilograms and carries 130 kilograms of payload to the surface of the moon. I can charge, as a commercial business, a million dollars a kilogram to a mid-latitude and a million, 1.25 million to, to a polar region. Where did that number came from? We made it up. That we had to set the market. But by declaring, here's what we can fly, here's how often we can fly, and here's the price, all three missions are full already, full of payloads. There's no more space left on the missions. Just a few kilograms here and there. So what we did was we packaged our first mission. We're flying five NASA payloads and four commercial payloads. We're actually getting quite a number of sponsorships where um, sponsors come and say, can I put a patch on your helium tank and take a picture of it? And now I'm sponsored and, I, and I want, I'll pay you for that. So there's digital payloads that are coming about that don't weigh anything where we actually can, can charge people for that. The second mission we said, all right, I'm a, I bought part of a booster on the first mission. 
What if we bought the whole booster on the second mission? So for the second mission, we bought the whole Falcon 9 5500, the whole thing. And we put, a, a, it's called an ESPA ring or a payload adapter on the bottom where we can mount payloads up to 1,000 kilograms of payloads on the bottom of the lander area, that gold ring. And we could take them out to translunar injection or out to cislunar space. Nobody thought they could do that. We set a price for that. $30,000 a kilogram to send you out to translunar injection. And you know what? It's full. It filled up already. And then we did that over and over again. One of the things we did, right, part of innovation, trying to figure out how to, how to make money, keep the company alive, keep doing this for less than $100 million, is we took one of those ports, which we owned, right, because we bought the whole booster and we built a lander, and we bought our own communication satellite. And so over here on the right, that white, every time we go to the moon, starting with mission two, we're putting our own intuitive machines communication satellite around the moon. We're the first US communication satellite in history around the moon. That goes up in December of 2022. And I have a plan to put a constellation of four satellites around the moon, two in frozen polar orbits, uh, so I can see the backside of the moon as well as the poles one in equatorial orbit, and one at a Lagrange point L2. And we'll own communications around the moon as well as our own GPS constellation around the moon so that we have navigation, communications in the city of the moon, back to Earth, and landing on the moon anywhere, access to land anywhere on the moon. All out of the first task order that came from NASA to land on the moon within 30 months for less than $100 million. And built this whole market is now coming alive as a result of it. It's extraordinarily exciting. Um, this one I'll, I'll preface, this is a little ending video and then I'm happy to take any kind of questions. Um, so how do you do this? So we started with, oh my God, how are we gonna compete and build a lander? Somebody actually came to our offices and we didn't even know about this CLIPS program and they said, you know what? Um, you're the best lander company in the country today. And we said, what? We're working on oil and gas projects. We're working on medical devices and we're working on some aerospace um, service contracts. But we had done this inside of NASA, some of us, to build the Morpheus lander, which was a liquid oxygen, liquid methane lander test bed. And we were gonna put a walking robot on the moon in a thousand days. Remember that project, Project N? And so the people from NASA knew that we had been thinking about putting a lander on the moon. And so they said, you should bid on this. So we looked at it and we said, yes, and we invested in ourselves and bid on it. And we realized we don't have any money. How are we going to do this? How are we going to win this? So I scraped up about $5 million. And we said, we can't build. We, we need to get to blue flame. We need to fire our engine and put that in our proposal so that we win our first proposal. How are we going to do that? Can't afford to build an engine test cell, build a facility with block walls and spray fire X and blast, you know, blast areas, buy that real estate, build that up. That was going to cost us, I don't know, half a million dollars at least. So we went to the Houston auction and bought a truck, a flatbed truck for $16,000. And on the flatbed truck, we built our own steel, welded our own steel blast walls. We filled them with sand. We put uh, helium bottle, or I'm sorry, nitrogen bottles and, and a regulator panel and then pressurized a liquid oxygen doer and a liquid methane doer and put the feed lines out to a, a little test cell. And then we put our engine on the back. We drove it out onto Ellington Field at an abandoned taxiway and fired it down the, down the taxiway. We got Arturo Machuca's uh, uh, approval and we fired it and took a picture of it and put it in our proposal. And we won, and we won that first mission. So what I want to show you here is that, what it looks like. And we're developing this engine, 3D printed, 100% 3D printed, and this engine's been through iteration after iteration after iteration. We've done 59 hot fires out on the runway with this system already. And what we do is we bring the software with the avionics, with the propulsion system, with the guidance navig control, navigation control sensors and make that all work together. And that is the lander before the lander gets packaged as a finished product. And that technique is our technique, is the way we did it. 
instead of saying, let me go build a lander and let me try to free fly it, which doesn't fly in 1G, it flies in 1.6G. So we had to find a new way to put a lander together and make sure it all works. And, and, and here's how it's coming along. So we now have this rig called a mobile test stand. It works so well, we're gonna qualify our whole lander on what I now call the vertical test stand, which is a little bit more expensive, $24,000 truck, <laughs> less miles, newer one. And we did the same thing, but stacked it vertically, much more like the lander. So here you go, take a look. So it's been uh, quite interesting. The COVID pandemic has caused us um, a little bit of a setback in the supply chain, as you've read about and you've heard, right? Um, we've managed through that. I said at the beginning of the COVID pandemic that there will be no layoffs in the company and everybody will get a paycheck regardless. And we did that and survived and kept working. Sent all the software people home to work in their basements or wherever they do their software work and keep coding. I left the technicians who are touch labor, social distance in our facilities and continue to machine parts, 3D print engines. And we had a, what we called a hygienic hot fire where we equipped everybody with personal protective equipment and sent them out onto the runway to test fire the engines. And we never stopped and we never stopped. But in the end, it ended up costing us about a four month delay in the mission, um, but we made it. Um, so. Uh, been pretty exciting. The supply chain still continues to be a problem. The pandemic, whether we're going to uh, come out of that completely where we open up and the supply chain issues are fixed, we'll, we shall see. Um, I've had some troubles with the tanks. Uh, we built our own tank technology, which is the first cryogenic um, linerless composite tank in history. Um, so it's a uh, carbon fiber fabric with a, a pre-print fabric with a with epoxy, polymer epoxy, and then uh, we have uh, 3D printed Inconel fittings on it, and uh, it leaked in the beginning, and, and it failed at burst, and then we found that we had a different coating problem, and it leaked again. We've had to redesign it, and so it's running a little late, so what I don't have yet is the fully assembled lander to show around and say, and do tests, and so we've had to find a different way and that's by building another qualification test rig called a vertical test stand, much like the one you saw there. So we're making quite a bit of progress. I have an announcement next week. I can't say it today um, because uh, we still have to wait until we get the official uh, go ahead. Uh, but things are moving forward and the future is very bright for intuitive machines. And uh, I want you to leave here today, but I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, always looking up at the moon with a little bit of different perspective thinking about, you know, that's attainable. That, if you put your mind to it with limitless thinking, you too can achieve something like landing on a moon for the first time for the United States in 50 years. So thank you for your patience and your time. Happy to answer any questions. So I'm not exactly a country west of the fan, but we do have this quote that we use is, how can the sky be the limit when there's footprints on the moon? <laughs> and I think there's going to be more footprints in the moon. Before we get to questions, though, um, I want to thank you very much for that. We have a bit of time. I, wouldn't, I wonder if you could take a couple of minutes to say how you've been working with the Edge Center, which is another thing that we're developing at the Spaceport, and how you've been really instrumental in Jupiter Machine. So there's the educational component. I think people would be in just a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, I, know, I know I'm sort of coming at you cold on this. You, may, you don't have any slides on it, but... This has been an important aspect of the growth of the spaceport as well, and I was just wondering if you might just take to. a couple of minutes and then I'll come to questions. If you're online, if you put them in the chat, I'll see if I can catch them on the, the system up here. So one of the weaknesses of Houston and the Houston spaceport itself, um, and we've seen that because we've lost paying customers coming into the spaceport of Houston, is that we didn't have a touch labor workforce. There weren't enough technicians, aerospace quality technicians, to build 
the systems that are needed for companies to move and relocate. There was great economic incentive packages from the city of Houston and the state of Texas, but where was the workforce? You know, Johnson Space Center is a programmatic space center that has engineering and management and program management and systems engineers, but it doesn't have the same uh, cadre of technicians that it used to have. And all the spacecraft and space systems are not built here in Clear Lake or Houston. Um, so there's a dearth of touch labor. So what we found was um, other states were offering uh, a, a robust workforce with facilities and incentives. And so uh, Mario Diaz and Atura Machuca, David and some others, including Dr. Brenda Hallier from uh, San Jacinto Community College, went on a tour and looked at a number of um, uh, sponsored uh, development centers at, at airports and universities and said, look at all this equipment, look at all this touch labor. And so they came back committed to building a program to train aerospace uh, technicians. And I chair that uh, program, uh, that advisory board, industry advisory board for San Jacinto Community College. And we built what we call the EDGE Center. And it's to train um, machinists and electrical technicians and pneumatics technicians and mechatronics technicians and composite technicians and quality inspectors and to train them in certification programs online. Um, but then I stepped up and said, come work with Intuitive Machines, I'll give you internships. And if you do good in the internships, I'll hire you and give you jobs. And we encourage the whole advisory board to do that, the industry advisory board to do the same thing. And so now we have a, a fully operational uh, training program where we're training uh, uh, these technicians. Actually, I share some of our senior machinists and technicians to actually go in and act as uh, faculty to teach the students, and then we do an internship, and then we hire them. And I've hired um, the first six out of the program already are in the, in the company with who, who, and, and if you listen to them, they say, I never imagined, ever imagined in my life, I'd be working on something, a piece of hardware that's actually going to the moon. And it's changed their whole life and their whole perspective. And so it's a wonderful program. We coexist in the first building, the building you saw in the first video, uh, the spaceport building, where Intuitive Machines is right alongside San Jacinto Community College. And that is really a special thing. So we actually created the first ever operational spaceport by putting industry with academia and the government and put that together with economic development. So it's quite, quite impressive. Yeah. And it's another part of the, the, the gap that was needed to fill to be able to do all this stuff, you know. Yeah. And just so you know, we're extending that to we call it the Houston Spaceport Center for Research, Education and Workforce Development, building up from the workforce development part into the research universities like A&M and us working with TSU on the aviation side and UH Clear Lake for some of the project side as well. So there's some things that we're trying to do to, to actually to bring all of that part together. And I think um, it would not be possible without having companies like uh, I am uh, doing what they do. So we have a question, We're very keen at the back. Um, yes. you don't, uh, maybe speak up since... Uh, yeah, well, Oh, geez, don't know that's in our near future. Um, NASA had a program, has a program or a series of programs under the Artemis construct, which is called. It's, uh, Artemis is to return humans in a sustainable way to the moon. Uh, it was slated for 2024, although um, the House and the Senate did not provide the appropriation necessary to fund the, all the equipment that was necessary. So now I think the, um, uh, Administrator Senator Nelson came out and said 2025, but they awarded SpaceX the human lander system, and they're about to come out with a spacesuit procurement. So we'll see. Um, uh, yeah, 2028, 2030, probably. I think it's uh, first steps are to get boots on the moon. So the precursor is small, relatively small, 2,000 kilogram land, um, autonomous robotic lander landing on the moon with ease, frequency every year. That's what I presented. Um, building two boots on the moon and then uh, prospecting on the moon 
in situ resource utilization on the moon, habitats on the moon. Um, that's all in the roadmap, and it's as, it'll go as fast as it's funded. So it could be 20, 40 or so, or later? It depends on the funding that's going to come from the U.S. government. It's going to take billions and billions and billions. Yes, sir? What sort of pressure are you bringing in your uh, wireless components? What's, what's the maximum pressure that you uh... Yeah, so our operating pressure on a tank is about 300 PSI. We lift off from the pad at like about 50 psi, so it's not very hazardous on the pad. But once we separate, once we get you know going after the high vibe uh, environment of launch, uh, we'll pressurize the tank to about 300 psi. Uh, we use 6,000 psi helium to pressurize the cryogens, and then uh, so it's pressurized blow down system with film cooled engine. Um, so that's that's where we're operating. Thought about uh, selling data as a service um, uh, using your data assets. Is that is that in your uh, strategy? Absolutely. We went in and looked at um, and creating data plans that says you can buy. Uh, what is it? Uh, I think the megabytes or gigabytes. I think it's megabytes. Eight megabytes of data per day for seven days for a certain price. Um, here's your antenna cutouts. Here's, you know, we have a whole program to sell that data back to any of the other vendors that are flying to the moon, or even if you wanted to, uh, NASA or the Space Force wanted to buy our network and we use it interoperably with their networks. And you have agreements so that uh, the, your providers will, your dish providers will let you have as much bandwidth as you want? Yep. Not as much as we want, <laughs> but fit within their available bandwidth. Second question was, uh, do you have plans for uh, uh, scale-up to a much larger payload delivery to the moon, or is it, are you going to just stay in this niche? Uh, great question. And actually, we're moving from Nova C, which C is Roman numeral for 100. We have Nova D, 500, and Nova M, which is 1,000, right? So that was the rough nomenclature. So we use the same core uh, avionics. Uh, power system, GNC, flight software, it's all the same. Structure changes. Uh, same propulsion system, but it's scalable. So we move from taking about 130 kilograms per mission um, to 500 to 750 uh, kilograms of payload per mission, that's Nova D, to about uh, three and a half metric tons in Nova M. And so we have a family of landers, uh, Nova C, Nova D, Nova M. And the propulsion technology has already been scaled for Nova D and Nova M. So we took the engine, which is about a 900-pound thrust uh, engine, um, and we've scaled it already to a 3,500-pound engine. Um, and it's the same design. It just scales up with different 3D printing parameters. So yes, we plan to be a cargo delivery service, not just a science instrument service. I was waiting for a supernova. <laughs> this, this is an easy one. Can you repeat the name? education program, and does it result in a, a two-year degree, a associate's degree? It's a certificate program. Um, we go online, and there's a, a, we built as the industry advisory panel the curriculum that you would get, including core skills like communications and resume writing and things like that, as well as safety, quality, and then how do you run a CNC machine? You know, how do you run a tube bender? Things like that. But it's called the EDGE Center. San Jacinto Community College Edge Center. Yeah. Thank you. You're yeah, and there's, there's also some of the conversations are about bespoke courses. I mean, so the, the fundamentals are there, again, through the committee that Steve heads up. <clears throat> but as uh, some of the places we visited, one of the things they do is work with specific companies and design bespoke collection of, sorry, bespoke's a very British term, if you, right, but, but basically customized programs building on some of the modular stuff that's there. So, I mean, because of the pandemic, the growth and the, the expected growth in the student body hasn't been as fast as we'd like, but that's that's picking up. I think, Juni, you tell me there's a question online. Thank you very much. Um, so this is from Pedro Blanco. It's great to know that your company, I should probably read this uh, ahead of time just in case. Yeah, just in case there's <laughs> slip a word in there. It's great to know that your company is collaborating to have the education programs and aerospace skills. How, um, 
how other professionals, not at the moment in the aerospace industry, but can learn. How, so how can other professionals, not in the aerospace industry currently, uh, how can they collaborate? I would clean windows in your facility just to be involved in a lunar exploration commercial project. Um, that's awesome. Um, yeah, uh, I, can uh, I can answer a couple different ways. Um, one is uh, the San Jacinto Community College has actually built the Ed Center, came as, uh, as a spin-off or another variant of the uh, Petrochem. Petrochem and the Maritime Institutes. So they train uh, maritime pilots um, and, and, and sailors that go out for merchant um, uh, purposes and they train uh, technicians and workforce and quality for the petrochem industry. And so this is the third that's set up to train specifically for the aerospace industry. So that's pretty unique and that, that works across, I mean it actually started in oil and gas, right? So that's how the cross cutting is. There's a way to work where during the pandemic in particular, we were helping to recruit um, oil and gas technicians when the price of oil plummeted uh, and there was huge layoffs in the oil field to say, could we retool some of those technicians um, who have the skills to work with their hands? Can you retool them to the aer aerospace quality standards, dimensional tolerances and things like that and say, can you work with these different materials and can you, and that has worked. So this idea of can you work from a different industry over in the aerospace? Absolutely. Um, we've taken people from all walks of life to be part of the lunar program, not just aerospace engineers. So there's room uh, if you need to. And also, as the, as the spaceport grows, there's going to be a huge amount of commercial activity to support the companies that are there. You have everything from coffee shops to supply chain issues to housing and a whole bunch of the, a lot of the commercial real estate uh, folks are involved or looking to get involved. So that's another thing that's part of this that we don't over, we don't stay enough is that this is a, a jobs creation effort at the spaceport and that brings the subsidiary stuff with it along with the really cool lunar stuff. Um, I, I have a, it's a kind of different kind of question, but so this is your visionary hat, right? So you're taking a bunch of commercial payloads up as, long, as well as the NASA. So that's a great transition, right? It's not just NASA doing NASA things. As, we, as this develops and as the other landing systems come on board, how do you see that commercial component of the commercial companies at the moon? What do you think they're going to be doing and, and where do you see that growth and what are the key areas um, that are going to come out of that increased involvement? Yeah, very good. Um, what we're seeing is, you know, and as we go out and we raise investment to scale the company um, exponentially, as, um, the question always comes is, when do you wean off the government and become a self-sustaining commercial business, right? And so we look at the markets that are available there. And I think, well, communications, um, it, I say we're always partnering with the government. You never go out into the solar system purely com commercially. There's always a need for the government be right alongside, it's strategic, it's the high ground, the government will be there. So the, the, the goal is to blend the commercial with government. And so this idea of a commercial uh, communications network, a commercial navigation network, you know, you just think about how we've gone off the planet uh, into low Earth orbit and the commercial services of bringing data back to Earth, imagery back to Earth, right, In, information about the Earth. So there's a number of data services that we would provide in imagery, surveillance data, mapping data, resource data, uh, communications data, navigation data. That's one set. The other one is resource utilization. So we've already been talking to Australia, uh, Space Agency and some companies in Australia about what do they do? They love prospecting and mining and there's rare materials on the moon. And so the idea of prospecting and owning all the data for prospecting on the, on the moon and finding where the valuable resources are is definitely a commercial endeavor, and we're pursuing that, right? So that's another one. And then, uh, commercially, the advance of additive manufacturing or 3D printing, there are a lot of companies trying to figure out how to print using uh, regolith, the lunar soils, how to make structures out of uh, additive manufacturing machines and, and the soil on the moon. So a lot of companies studying that, um, they think that's going to be lucrative. 
How do you build structures on the surface of the moon using additive machines? So those are just a few, Dave. Um, I mean, I could ask lots of questions, but you don't, yes, stop. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you mentioned 3D printing composites fit. How does material science fit in the innovation of additive machines? Yeah, so I think what I've aimed to do, you know, because of the tight budget and a tight timeline, was to minimize technology advancements to get to the moon in, in 30 months, right? You don't want to load, load up with an exotic um, uh, set of technologies that you then stumble trying to get them developed. But we develop our own composite recipes, uh, the different fibers and the different epoxies to create the different strength profile and, uh, in all the materials from the uh, densified aluminum uh, honeycomb to the composite materials on top to the materials used in the tanks, the materials used in the end fittings for our struts that are super high strength. So a lot of composites work. Um, and then also our Inconel and titanium and columbium, which is, a, which is an alloy of niobium, uh, those are metals that we actually 3D print. And we have advanced technologies for 3D printing those materials. And so I can make, um, I can 3D print a titanium bracket that if I designed it and machined it traditionally would, would weigh um, three kilograms. And if I did it using generative design algorithms and this new titanium printing technique, it's half a kilogram. So I'm saving incredible amounts of mass. And really the innovations are occurring in, you can't buy the, 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 the size of a system you need at the mass bogey you want. So everything we do is to drive mass out of the vehicle so that you're launching the lightest weight vehicle you can uh, to maximize the amount of payloads. So every kilogram that we save in building the lander is a million dollars a payload. Think of that. So that's where our technology is going. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Add Lunum. Yeah. Awesome shirt. You got to show everybody the back of your shirt. Yeah, no, the back is really nice. But I just love intuitive machines. There's intuitive machines with the lander going out to the moon. They can get those on our website uh, and go to uh, Amazon. I'm selling you something. I got them for two beers, so I'm pretty cheap here. Sorry, please. Yeah, uh, so what are the biggest challenges? Um, time, time, not technology, not the performance of the lander, it's time. Um, the ability to get the whole thing together, integrated, uh, tested, and for the first time ever, you know, we're building essentially a Ferrari by hand, you know, for the first time. And so uh, everybody's working as hard as they can, and it, it's time. I, I said that over and over again, I could use more time. So um, trying to fit it all into the amount of months we have left is incredibly challenging. Yeah, so all the qualification, we, we've been through all the development testing. So figuring out how strong the landing gear had to be and how much crushable structures in there, we've done all that testing, right? Uh, figuring out how the engine injector um, spray pattern needs to look so that we get the right specific impulse on the engine, we've done that. Um, figuring out how to ignite that mixture ratio, we've done that. But now what you have to do is you have to put the flight components together. So all the boards, we buy a flight computer, but all the controllers we, we build ourselves, making sure there's no spurious signals, turning it around and building the flight design, and then testing that flight design in an integrated environment with the right cabling, with the right software, uh, get the right signals, that. Um, and all the signal noise that comes with it in the right ground plane to get the signal out, to get the end effector to move, to get it all performing, that's the testing that we're doing now, bringing out all those bugs. Uh, no, I don't need them. Uh, we're not using the NASA for any of that stuff. Um, what I did was uh, I have a Space Act agreement with NASA where I borrowed the Morpheus tanks, which are LOX methane aluminum tanks, because the composite tanks had to get through a redesign. So what we did is we started our qualification on the, on the propulsion system using the aluminum tanks, which are heavier, and then I'll change those out and put the flight tanks in and then finish the qualification. So NASA's been helpful. Um, the other thing in our ground network, which is pretty amazing, 
Uh, we went to Moorhead State in Kentucky, Goonhilly in the UK, Australia, is, uh, Parks Dish is in Australia. Um, and actually we acquired uh, from Moorhead the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And we took S-band data down from the LRO down through our antenna um, and then back to our mission control. So our network is actually taking bits and bytes from the moon and processing all the way in our mission control. So that was a, a help and assistance from NASA too, was to, was to be able to look at the LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and process their data. So. Yeah, so the, your confidence of the lunar uh, vacuum and thermal environments might have caused any undesirable effects? Uh, we are doing the, the EMI, EMC, thermal vac uh, testing, but we don't need the NASA chain. We, we're using uh, vendor supplied chambers. Okay. Yeah. So we're still doing the testing though. For sure. Steve, I forgot when Doug asked his question, these three here are students who are working on the first student developed CubeSat for Rice. We had a different CLIPS program in NASA, CubeSat Launch Initiative. LSAT 1, LSAT 2, they want to be a lunar orbiting CubeSat. Oh, really? We, this, we I don't really know if these guys will be here, <laughs> but it'll be the next generation of students that they bring through. So we know who to talk to. Go ahead. Yeah, along those lines, um, how have you and how are you currently integrating your the different systems on your lander? Did you define um, different sub-modules um, so that you could test individual modules and then integrate them? Um, Do you follow any specific strategies such as what NASA did us, for example? Right, yes, great question. Um, so what we've done is we follow um, the Goddard Space Flight Center gold rules, which are rules of thumb for mass, power, growth, and, and, uh, and that. We've also follow a tailored version of 7120.5, which is the Program Project Management Handbook, and the 7120.7123, which is the SCNI, Systems Engineering Integration Handbook. But what was really Beneficial is that having come personally from human spaceflight, 25 years in human spaceflight, I think we as a company and individuals know where to trim those documents. And so we know where you can take the risk and where you shouldn't take the risk, right? So then what we do is we go in there and say, all right, we know every cable needs a continuity check, needs a high pot test, right? And so then we'll say, okay, here's a work package with a, with a spine or a panel that has little boxes on it with the cable harnesses, and then that'll be tested as a unit before it goes on the vehicle. Right. So we have these sub-assemblies that we put together. All the helium legs are tested and leak checked, and all the orbital welds are checked before that gets into a final assembly. Do right. all of the subsystems rely on the inputs and the outputs of the other because it's an integrated lander? How do you make that decision of what defines that subsystem? Where do you draw the line? Yeah, so what you find is, you know, here's a subsystem that says I, all the common data handling is here and all the controllers that go here. And then you look at each system as what it traditionally should look at. But then what you'll find is there's touch points that aren't covered by either system and you have to highlight those early on in the design and say, how are we handling this function? So we came up with, okay, you got a flight computer, right? That's got to drive um, an engine actuator or a throttle valve. Well, who's stewarding the commands between the flight computer and that controller that controls that actuator or that valve? We came up with a new component that was a main engine controller that had to process those signals coupled with all the pressure and the temperature transducers, put that all together um, and, and make decisions to move those actuators or throttle valves or whatever we're doing. And we identified nobody had that responsibility. So we had to go put that in. So it takes careful architecting of the design at the very beginning to make sure all those functions are assigned. And then when you test them, just because you've tested at a subsystem doesn't mean they're plug in. Even if you have that interface specified, they won't come together naturally. There'll be problems there, yeah. right? But if you test early and often, you could ring out whether it's on the software or the hardware side, but if you do integrated testing much later at the at the lander level, you don't you struggle forever trying to decide which side of the fence that problem is occurring. Too many um, unknowns. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
you remember the payload design class? It was, uh, it was the ICD that you always have to worry about, right? The interface control documents, which is uh, will kill you. We have, a, we have another um, question from Ali, or not another question from Ali, but another question online from Ali. Excellent work. My question is about spaceports. What are infrastructure resources, what infrastructure resources are needed in spaceports other than the workforce to match the growth in aerospace applications? That's a great question. Um, in, in our building uh, that we're building, the brand new uh, Intuitive Machines building at Spaceport Houston, um, we're building a production facility. What you need to do in order to build space systems is you need a, a technical facility, not just office space. So we have bridge and trolley cranes, uh, we have composites labs, we have communications labs, we have avionics labs, we have bonded storage, um, we have clean rooms. Right? Three flatbed trucks. Flatbed <laughs> trucks, right? So you need the facility to be a technical facility um, that can handle the movement of heavy equipment, of storage, of logistics, of all of those things, and that's what a spaceport needs. It needs more than office buildings. It needs the ability to bring people together, to take their ideas and turn them into real hardware and software. Uh, that's what I envision a spaceport being. And then the other piece is these collaboration areas where you can actually bring researchers together and researchers and scientists and engineers and technicians can come together and, and learn from each other. And so you want to create a common area that's not only a company, that where we only get to talk to ourselves, but you can spill out into a common area like Rice Campus, and you can exchange ideas, and you can exchange um, thoughts and business, and you can create um, um, uh, uh, things out of that spontaneously, out of that connection between people. Uh, one of the examples I use is the uh, CERN Super Collider. You know what, all the physicists that do particle research fly to CERN to sit at coffee shops and get ready for work and to use the super collider. Do you not think there are ideas that are exchanged there, high value ideas that are just going back and forth? We wish we in the United States built that super collider so we would have those ideas, you know, bubbling out of our coffee shops in the vicinity of our super collider, right? That's what I think a spaceport and particularly Spaceport Houston can be because Spaceport Houston um, is in the middle of a metropolis. And so you want that R&D and that exchange of ideas, education and, uh, and business occurring there concerning space and aviation. And, and you notice he didn't mention launch once in all of that. And that's, that's crucial for why Houston is doing so well, because everybody's waiting for that launch operator to show up and then everybody else is going to bring, come in in the coattails. Houston and with, with Arturo's leadership and Mario and, and with help from many people around the, the city are doing it the other way around. They're building the space systems and then if the launch operator wants to come, the runway's there, the license is there and so that's one of the things that everybody keeps saying, when are we going to launch? It doesn't matter. We're building things that are going to, are going to the moon and so I think that's one of the key things that we have here in Houston. And in part we can't launch rockets because we don't want to kill anybody. But, um, but yeah, so that, that's an important aspect of what we're doing here in Houston. I don't know if there's any other questions on that. Others? Add my, Mr. Adlunum again, please. Yeah, John, about software simulation. Can you talk about what you do to provide similar surrender and how you're able to get off the shelf products or coming out building houses? Yeah, we, um, our software backbone at the application layer is called Core Flight Software. It's a NASA sourced. Uh, software architecture. Actually, when I worked at NASA, I made a deal with Goddard Space Flight Center engineering director and myself, and we figured out, let's give this away. Um, and so Core Flight Software became a real-time, uh, high dynamic, capable uh, software system, real-time operating system. Um, we then use, uh, for our simulation, we use uh, a NASA-based product called Trick, uh, which you're able to simulate uh, uh, spacecraft systems as well as trajectories and gravity and uh, aerodynamic models for coming into the atmosphere and puts all that physics with your spacecraft systems. Um, and then what we do is we take flight software and simulation and then we build another ground uh, software system. And uh, we have, uh, 
what the heck, I can't remember the software for the ground system right off the top of my head. I'll remember it before I finish talking here. Um, and then what we've done, which is really special about that, is we've created an abstraction layer so that the software, the flight software that's working, doesn't is, doesn't, is agnostic to the platform or the test bed that it's operating on. So if we go onto the truck to test, the flight software never changes. If we're testing in the control center, the flight software never changes. If we're testing on a flat sat test bed, the software never changes. But the layer around it changes to, for each facility. And that means the software is always, 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 always improving and never being rewritten for the test bed. It saves you a ton of time. And by the way, one of the innovations here is software in this project has never been behind or missed a delivery in the history of the, in our project. And we've written all that software already has full functionality in it. That's unheard of. Right, in any kind of project. Software is always the long haul. I used to work at Lockheed Martin. <laughs> <laughs> you poor guy. Okay. Um, is it SDK? Well, SDK is a satellite um, simulation. We use that for some of our comm loops on the trajectories that are going out to the moon and where we need comm coverage. We use Satellite Development Toolkit, yeah. Okay, so I've got one last question online. That's a good question because it leads into an announcement I forgot to mention earlier. So this is from Colin. You have artists at CERN too. Will you have creative artists too? Create creativity in the coffee shop. So, great question. I, I, they, they must have been in our facility. So we hired a knot, um, who was a special person. Um, and Dave, you might have seen it there in our facility. We said, we have to make our assembly room look like a uh, space assembly room. So a knot is this uh, Israeli artist who came to the United States and got a visa uh, and was only allowed to stay in, in, in the country if she painted. So we gave her a job to paint a mural on our assembly facility. And she came in with a cart um, and a paintbrush. And she started in one corner. And we took time lapse of it. And she painted the whole uh, assembly room all around, about up to eight feet high of the lunar landscape with our landers landing and the rovers roving and terraforming with big greenhouses on it, all out of her head with no sketches or whatsoever. And uh, she was awesome. And so uh, they did a special for her on her and highlighted her and we posted it on Facebook. She made awesome baked goods, but that whole place is now, you know, we blend um, the art of engineering with the science of engineering. So I really appreciate that question. Because personally, I find myself on the art of engineering more than the science of engineering. So, uh, as I promised you, very good. Uh, and the discussion in particular was really good. I really appreciate uh, the time you've taken to come out to talk to us, Steve. So, if you wouldn't mind joining me in, in thanking our speaker tonight. And speaking about art, it turns out in the last couple of weeks, I've had a whole bunch of artists approach me for various things, be, from different countries actually, because space is actually generating a lot of real interest. Um, in December 10th, we're going to have a conversation with an artist, which is going to feature myself as the least part of it. Um, artist Cl uh, Clarissa Tosin, who did a, 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 an installation here at Rice a few, uh, a couple of months ago. And David Kring from the Lunar Planetary Institute, who's like the leading expert on, on a lot of stuff to do with the science of the, of the moon. He was one of our speakers a few months ago too. Um, there's going to be a new exhibit at the Saw, oh, I forgot the name of it. There's a theater in Houston, starts with Saw something. Ah, I can't remember, anyway. Um, it's going to be, it's called The Infinite. It's a Canadian company and it's an immersive uh, exhibit featuring footage from the space station. So there's a lot of real folks in the art world thinking about how they can communicate, get that personal impact. Because if we go to the moon, it's going to be a human component to the moon. And we don't want to be so divorced from it that it's just somebody else doing something. And that's, and that's where the artists become really important. So um, really exciting time, I think. So again, um, if I don't see you, enjoy your holidays. I know they're, they're coming up thick and fast. Hopefully we will see this conversation with an artist. Keep your eye on intuitive machines, watch out for their announcements, watch out for their, not just their announcements, but their achievements. Um, and, you know, keep your eye on the spaceport as well, because there's a lot going on. And ELSAT, 
Rice will be launching the satellite in June, I hope. <laughs> Good luck um, to you. So anyway, thanks again, Steve, and thank you all. all right.